Let's continue in our uh, studies now. We're going to look at chapter 2, verses 17 following. And uh, here we have the apostle beginning to get a little specific with the Romans. And, and part, of the, part of the difficulty here is recognizing the fact that, you know, is this book written to the Gentiles or is it written to the Jews or is it written to the Romans in general? What is this? What's going on here? Because Paul at times seems to be speaking specifically to the Jews and other times he seems to be referring specifically to the Gentiles. And you have to pay close attention to see who's he rebuking or chiding or encouraging or whatever he's doing. Who's he talking to? Because if you identify the wrong group, you may actually uh, misunderstand the meaning. So uh, we, we look at the text. He says, if you, he says, speaking to the Jews, he says, if you who are named Jew, Eudias is the Greek, the word for, uh, where you get the word Judah. You know, the word Jew comes from the word Judah, historically. Yes. And you have the ten tribes in the north with the rebellion that took place with uh, Jeroboam. And then you have the two tribes left over in the south under Rehoboam. And the two southern tribes were Benjamin and Yehuda in the Hebrew. And Benjamin's a little bitty old small tribe. So essentially it's absorbed into Judah. And Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah. Right? In the south. So the ten northern tribes went essentially out of existence. For, in the sense of identification. Uh, the Jewish people are largely identified with the land. Their land. Now, I realize today people talk about the land of Israel, the state of Israel, and the, uh, the, the uh, state of Palestine. Well, see, there never has been a state of Palestine in the history of the world. That's a new reality. If, if they create a state, we'll be their first one. And we do need 47 Muslim nations. We have one Jewish nation, and we, we have 46 Muslims, so we need another Muslim one. And that will be the 47th uh, with so-called Palestine. The word Palestine, by the way, comes from the Latinized form of the word Philistine. And when Hadrian came in in 135 against the Simon Bar Kokhba revolt, he renamed Israel, actually Judea and Samaria, he named it Philistia, the ancient enemy of, of Israel, as a derisive term, a put-down. And, uh, and, of course, the Latinized form comes over to us as Palestine. So there really ha there are no Palestinians in reality. These, what, what the so-called Palestinian today are Jordanians, largely, who move over into what we think of as Israel, the land of Israel. They're Jordanian. They're Arabs. They don't have a language or an ethnic background separate from their being Arab uh, from, from Jordan. But here you have the word Eudaios. If you should be named a Jew, and um, you uh, rely or, or rest on the law, and boast in God, and you know the will, literally the will, it doesn't say his will, in Greek it's, if you know the will, uh, and you, um, if you are approved, if you approve the, um, the better things, it's sort of a strange term here, if you approve the things that are better, dia fero, fero is the idea of to bear, dia means the idea of through, to bear through something. So diaferanta here is the idea of one who actually, the things that are excellent. And you are, um, are having been instructed out of the law. And you've persuaded yourself that you are 
uh, a, uh, a guide of blind people. A light to those who are in darkness. Well, let's just stop and we could just keep going. It's interesting to see how he's developing these things. He's looking at the Jew and he says, you know, you guys have a pretty good opinion of yourself. You think that you are really quite special. And you know the point of it is, they were. <laughs> but it's one thing to have certain blessings that God has given. It's another thing to be a little bit arrogant in yourself. We can be thankful. I mean, you can have a person, for example, who is a great athlete or a great singer, a great musician. And they really are. But it's one thing to have a skill and, and do wonderful things. It's another thing to be basically taken with yourself. You know, it's like the old Cassius Clay, uh, uh, a.k.a. Muhammad Ali, and he used to say, uh, I'm the greatest. Well, you know, he was very good. But he, he, uh, he was a braggart also. So Paul looks at these people and he says, you know, uh, you have quite a significant heritage. You, if you should be named Jew, see, uh, and you have all of these benefits of, of being instructed in the law and boasting in God and knowing God's will and being approved with excellent things and, and being instructed out of the law and being persuade, you persuade yourself that you are a guide. The word hados in, in, uh, in Greek is the word for road or way. And this word is a similar word to it. One who's an instructor or a guide who leads other people, who leads blind people. And, and you have a, a, a light you offer to dead to uh, those who are in darkness. All these magnificent things. And then he goes on to say, and a, and a teacher, I do take. You ever heard of the word uh, uh, paideia? is a Greek term for uh, essentially child. And this is a term which means essentially one who teaches children. Uh, you're a teacher of those who are uh, aphronon. Aphroneo uh, in Greek is the concept of having knowledge or, or being, uh, having thought. And it's one who is basically without that. It's the concept here in, in verse, uh, uh, verse 20. The, um, remember we had another term about individuals who thought themselves to be wise who, um, who were morons. Remember that term last night? This is a similar word. It means to be non-thinking, essentially. And it means uh, someone who is a fool. So he says, what you, you are, you're someone who teaches or corrects the fool. And you're and a teacher of children. Now you have different words for children, but this is one for a small child. Uh, having the um, uh, the form, the the word morphe. You're familiar with morphology or morphing. Here's your word that relates to that. M o r p h o s i n. If you're looking at it here. Uh, let me just sort of show that to you. It's interesting to see all these words because you find a lot of words that we have actually used in our vocabulary. But the word uh, morphe in, in Greek, right, in English, the, the word here morphe, this particular word is the word um, uh, morphosin. But it's akin to this word means to have a form, but this means to have an outward form, okay, to have an outward form, a, a, a somewhat of a, a, uh, an aura of one who, who teaches the, um, see what it says, and having the f outward form of, of, uh, of knowledge and uh, of truth in the law. So he says, this is how you come over. It all seemed pretty good, really. So they had knowledge of God's law and they had a position as teachers. Various forms, it's interesting to look at this because 
You have all these designations of how they were in their person, and then there's, there's several words for teaching, see? Guide and teacher uh, of, of children and teacher and uh, knowledge and truth, all these things. Uh, these, these, these people seem to come over pretty well. And in verse 21, though, he moves another direction. Therefore, now you've learned that lesson, right? When something is there, when you see the word therefore, you want to know why it's there for? So you always pay attention to that. He says, if all these things are true, that you have all this knowledge and you have all this capability, high privilege, with privilege comes responsibility, right? You know that little statement, that little quip. With privilege comes responsibility. Therefore, the one who teaches the other, do you not teach yourself? The one who is preaching, now actually this is the Greek word, uh, you have several words used here. Uh, the one word you have is the word didasko. Uh, I'm having to re rewrite Greek. I learned Greek for years writing in a certain way. Like I learned the alphas doing here. I learned the phis like this. Um, some others. And then I got involved in, in in some advanced Greek in my master's program and they did the alphas like this and the phi's like this and I, now I, I sort of alternate between them. I'm trying to find some consistency in my Greek writing but you sort of get into habit. But So you'll see me make mistakes sometimes like that. Didasco and then the other word is K Russo which means to proclaim but it's the word we use for preach. Now the, it's kin to the word kerygma. Remember the uh, proclamation. Okay. So he says, Therefore, the one who is teaching another person, don't you teach yourself? The one who is preaching, you should not steal. Are you stealing? The one who is saying, Don't commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? Uh, the one who is, uh, uh, well, let's see. Let me try. Uh, the one who says he detests idols. It's an odd word. The one who is detesting the idols. Do you uh, rob temples? Commit sacrilege? That's. Well, Look at that a second. He says they have tremendous capability, tremendous privilege, and they're really good at talking. You have another word here, by the way. He, the next word he uses, Lego. Oh, here's another one I have trouble with. I learned to do gamma this way, and then I learned it this way. <laughs> Lego. Okay, so that um, Paul is good in using synonyms. It's interesting to follow him through here. Teaching, preaching, saying, he keeps using different terms. He says, uh, if you are saying don't commit adultery, do you? And if you're saying don't do, go against the, uh, uh, if you say you detest idols and yet you commit the sacrilege, Who boast in the law through the, um, let's see, they get the, uh, I was trying to think, what verse are we on here? Verse 23. 23, right, I got, okay, I got it, so, okay, here we are. Yeah, there's it. That's the word disobedience. Okay. Uh, who, whoever boasts in the law, um, through the disobedience of the law, God is dishonored. Now, what he's saying here is that these Jews had all this skill 
and they, uh, they claim they have so much ability and yet they don't practice the very thing that they uh, make a claim about. And so he says the point of it is if they make this big boast in reality because they do not fulfill their boast they end up actually dishonoring God. They find themselves uh, bringing shame upon the name of God. And then verse 24. Now you might not know this but I, what I've done in this new handout I, I don't think you, you, you have this one yet. But I've gone back. I've put in, the, in dark places that you have actually quotations from the Greek Old Testament. And this is a quotation from the Greek Old Testament. Uh, it's found in Isaiah 52.5. And so let's uh, sort of take a look there a second. Isaiah 52.5. Now therefore, what have I here, says Yahweh, that my people are taken away for nothing? Those who rule over them make them well, says Yahweh, and my name is blasphemed continually every day. Uh, that's one statement that Paul uses. Uh, I'm looking at the bottom of my, my textual apparatus in Greek, and the next example is in Ezekiel 36.20. You want to turn over to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 36.20. Where Ezekiel says, When they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said of them, These are the people of Yahweh, and yet they have gone out of his land. You see what that says? They said, These are the people of Yahweh, and yet they can't stay in the land. In other words, they did not live lives that reflected their relationship and their position with God. Ezekiel 36, 20. So that uh, this is then Paul the Apostle looking back and, and he says, just as it is written, for the name of God is blasphemed because of you in all... In, in the nations, or in the Gentiles, or among the Gentiles. See, what's supposed to have happened is that because of the Jews being God's special possession and receiving His special law and having His special protection and the word and revelation that God gave to them because of all of these features and all of these benefits that we talked about in verses 17, 18, 19 and 20 because of all of these things God's name was actually to have been honored and proclaimed and praised through the nations that's actually what God intended that because of his people he would receive honor through the nations. Now, I'm not saying that never did occur. Sometimes God did some things. For, remember that when God destroyed Egypt, he was, he was feared among the nations. And when they saw the Israelites come up, they said, we got a problem. Here comes up those people whose God wiped out Egypt. And thus he received glory. That's part of what we're going to look at in, in, uh, in Romans chapter 9 where the, uh, the text indicates that he raised Pharaoh up in order to smash him down. Raised him up so he could break his teeth in order that he could demonstrate his power among the nations. Now, you say, why is all that? I mean, Egypt was the most powerful nation in the world. And yet before God they were nothing. And so when the people heard these Israelites were coming up whose God 
did terrible deeds to um, to Egypt, they were fearful. They trembled. Remember the report that Rahab gave to the spies? <laughs> Everybody's heard about your God. This was how uh, God was to be viewed because of the people, not just because of himself. Now, you do have a situation. Remember that uh, we have Solomon honored. We think about that. Then the Queen of Sheba came up and said, man, the half wasn't told. But that was about Solomon. What about God? See, wouldn't it be wonderful if the Queen of Sheba came up and said, you know, half of what was said about your God that was not even told. That was never true. They're saying, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. I just wonder sometimes where we stand in that. You know, is God's name praised because of how we are, or is his name blasphemed because of how we are? I'm afraid so often, now don't get me wrong, I know that there can be maligning, uh, there can be misrepresentation. We do know that, that in, his, in history, uh, various people went to their death as martyrs for the love of, their, uh, love of Christ. And people spoke evil of them and God. Uh, didn't, in other words, their testimony of, of how good they were did not change people's hearts necessarily. But re there is a sense in which Jesus did teach uh, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's what God had intended for the Jewish people. They didn't perform well. They didn't come through very well. And so when we look on in the text, we find that God's name was dishonored and distorted. Verse 25. Moreover, not only was this indictment privilege being not fulfilled, their delinquency recounted, but the reason for circumcision became misunderstood in 25 to 29. Yes, sir. How do you think this part of the letter is received by the church in Rome? Well, like they been pretty put off at this point if there are any Jewish people there. Well, there are Jewish people there. And I expect that what you encountered, if you had been at the church in Rome, you'd see a bunch of Gentiles sitting back gloating and a bunch of Jews feeling bad. You think it's accurate? I do. Because we're going to see later on the Gentiles are gloating and Paul says something about it. He says, hey, you've been gloating a little bit. Let me tell you, if it wasn't for the Jews, you wouldn't have salvation. So he has to... But largely, this letter is written uh, against this, this conflict, I think, in the church. This Jew-Gentile difficulty. We've made a mistake in the church even today. See, Jews, because of, of a special relationship that they have with God, uh, nonetheless are uh, a little different from Gentiles, even today. They have a heritage. And I don't think you ask them to give it up. Why should I ask a Jew to give up his heritage when I keep my own? I have my practices, and I, I say, you've got to act like me. Where does it say, in order to be a Christian, you must act like a Gentile? I agree that the Bible teaches that there's not a wall of separation between Jew and Gentile in reference to participation in Christ, but that doesn't mean that they act, have to act like a Gentile. Jews are different than Gentiles in that, historically. And I've always been a little bit taken back sometimes when Christians... Uh, don't want Jews to go ahead and sort of identify with their past. They have a heritage. Uh, I, I, <laughs> matter of fact, some of the things I saw, I was with a guy by the name of Tuvia Zaretsky. Tuvia is a Southern California uh, person of the Jews for Jesus. He's also the, the Jews for Jesus uh, uh, liaison to Israel. And I was with uh, Tuvia one day. And I just saw this and I said, you know, sometimes I'm a little bit jealous of you being a Jew. I mean, I could like to, I would like to be a Jew in some way. There's so much there, there's so much history, so much identification. And we're gonna see some of that in a few minutes. Who's, 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 
you think, you know, being too is special. And I realized that, and, and basically two of you came back to me, yeah, well, we've had uh, You know, to be Jew was, to, was a death for, uh, for For much of the last 2,000 years, is but either a death warrant or degradation. Matter of fact, maybe even further back. We can go back to the death of all the time. So Tuvia's basic response, well, if being a Jew is such a great thing, maybe we should switch. You know, because I'd have less trouble. Uh, but God gave them tremendous privilege. And yet Paul says they did not use it properly of it. They used it wrongly even. So um, then they come to the idea of circumcision and they misconstrue it. Remember the words of the uh, Pharisees to uh, was it John or Jesus? I get it mixed up. When, he, when they said, we have Abraham as our father. I want to say it's Jesus, but I'm thinking it was John who said this. We have Abraham as our father. And whoever it was, I think it was John, he says, God can at least stones make children of Abraham. In other words, don't be boasting so much in the fact that you have Abraham as your father. Now, you've got to realize the issue of contrast. Remember in the Old Testament... God is the one who commanded the sacrifices. That was part of the law. God is not anti-sacrifice. Man, don't you know that PETA and these uh, animal rights groups would have a heyday in ancient Israel? Uh, they would not be uh, appreciating what was going on with the sacrifice system of Israel. And anybody who says, you know, that, that God wants to give some kind of equal rights to animals that he does with humans, or they equate it, simply don't understand what God has done, who created animals. See, because I don't think you abuse, for sure, but sacrifice is not an abuse because you were giving to God of your best. And there's also something to say about blood being spilt. Ultimately, all those things are typological and symbolic. So you have this situation where uh, the sacrifices were practiced by the people and God had commanded them to be practiced, but they began to lose the fact that the sacrifice was only the outward statement of an inward reality. They were to have sacrifice, in a sense, in their hearts before they sacrificed the animals externally. David says, he says, if I thought sacrifices really would be sufficient, man, I would get after it big. I got, as king, he could give a lot of sacrifice. He says, but I realize that what you want is a, a contrite heart. But then after he says that, then he says, in his conclusion, I will offer sacrifices. See, the point is, the, the sacrifices were a command of God. It's just that they were not to be given without a heart attitude of worship. And, for, and, and repentance. You came to, to offer the sacrifice for your sins. It's not as sometimes... It, remember the Roman Catholic Church developed a, a perspective called ex operato, which is essentially translated... Uh, that the, the event has value in and of itself is the sense of it. The, the operation of itself accomplished the task. So you could actually do this, the, 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 the particular uh, a sacrament or you could do the particular act and just the fact that you did it accomplished everything apart from the heart. You can baptize somebody all day long. And if there's nothing in the heart, it doesn't make a difference if they get wet. You can take the Lord's Supper all day long. If there's nothing in the heart, you don't get forgiveness. Uh, whether it be in, uh, in, in Lutheran theology or in other forms of theology, 
Uh, the point of it is that attached to sacrament must be faith. David understood that. He said, if I could accomplish it, I could give you all the animals you want. <laughs> but it wouldn't do a thing. For ultimately, what you want is my heart. A contrite one. But upon that heart being contrite, then God desires the sacrifices because we're told elsewhere in the scripture, they come forth as a sweet aroma to his nostrils. Now, I give that as an example because I think here we need to understand. These are contrasting concepts. God commanded circumcision. <laughs> but merely circumcising without something else being connected doesn't do a thing. The Pharisees thought that simply being Abraham's children and being circumcised made them essentially acceptable to God, apart from any other consideration. You know, they are going to heaven. I, I've read statements from some of the, uh, some of the ancient rabbis and others who, who essentially uh, indicated the fact, that, uh, the fact that they were the seed of Abraham was in and of itself sufficient to be acceptable to God. They needed nothing else. And, of course, they looked at anyone who was not circumcised as a dog, unclean, and such like. In other words, all of you and, you and I are, are, are Gentiles, I, probably. And, and because of that, we are worthless. We're scum. That's how many of the Jews viewed it. Now, if you come forth with that kind of arrogance, it's no, it's no surprise that sometimes people rebelled uh, uh, unfavorably against that view. People tend not to take that very, very well. So we come to the sign of circumcision. And the uh, term here uh, says, For on the one hand, uh, circumcision has benefit, Paul says, if you practice the law. It has benefit if you practice the law. But it's in and of itself is not sufficient. But if you're a breaker of the law, uh, here. Yeah. But if you are a breaker of the law, circumcision uh, essentially has no value. It's as you have become uncircumcised. Do you see that? So here you have this Jew that's circumcised and says, you know, I'm pretty special. I'm circumcised. And yet Paul says, if you break the law, it's as though you were uncircumcised. It has no value. Circumcision is only a symbol of an internal reality. If an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? So you have a, a crossover here. We can mark it up. So essentially you have a person who's circumcised And you have a uh, person who's uh, uncircumcised. Uncircumcised. Or however you spell it. You have a cross here. Keeps law. And he becomes as if he's circumcised. Whereas the uncircumcised, uh, over here is his not keep law. He becomes as if he's uncircumcised. So that's the movement you have in the logic. People bragging about being circumcised that don't keep the law are like they weren't circumcised. People who are uncircumcised who keep the law are like they were circumcised. That's the argument.
And will not the and will not the physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, if he fulfills the law, judge whether uh, who even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? Says the New King James. That sort of reads sort of hard here. Um, Therefore, if one is uh, is uncircumcised, should keep or guard the righteous things of the law, uh, and the one who is uncircumcised is he's not uh, reckoned as though he were circumcised, and and judge that that uh, by nature the uh, one who is uh, uncircumcised. That's a really hard statement in the Greek here. That must be why in the New King James they are uh, working it. They say here, for if he... Let's see. And will not the physically uncircumcised... That's verse 27. Let's see. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's a hard statement in Greek. Um... And judge that the one who is uncircumcised phuseos. Literally, the New King James translates this physically uncircumcised. But actually the term is the word for nature. If he's uncircumcised naturally, by nature. Are people born uncircumcised or circumcised? Uncircumcised, by nature, right? You're not, you're not born uncircumcised. Uh, if this one fulfills the law uh, give me just a second Let's see, and if uh, the one who by nature is uncircumcised should fulfill the law, judge whether, I suppose that would be the one way to bring it over, judge whether the one who uh, fulfills the written uh, code, the grammatos, the grammar, the, gra the, the written, I guess that's how they're getting the written code, and the circumcision, uh, is he a transgressor of the law? For the one who is a Jew... In the uh, in an outward way, he's not even in the. Boy, I tell you, this this is hard. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. In the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Well, let's just see if we can tackle that and figure this out here a moment. Paul's really got into a sort of an, uh, a very uh, intricate kind of statement here. If, you, if you're looking at the Greek text, it, there's, there's so much not here that you're trying to figure out what, what, uh, what he's getting at. Because what he's saying here is that... Uh, He's got this play. If you have an, a physically uncircumcised individual, and he fulfills the law by doing the, in other words, by doing the, the what he should be doing by doing the law, and yet you're circumcised and you're a transgressor of the law, who's better off? Is his point. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. In the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Now let me stop there a second. Uh, here's something you might not know right off front. Because again, these statements are, are, are really piercing statements. These Jews in, uh, in the Roman church are feeling a sting as they're reading this letter. Because the Jews put such emphasis upon the idea of keeping the law and circumcision. And then Paul says, big deal if you got these Gentiles keeping the law, they're better off than you who are not keeping the law, even though you're circumcised. 
and their keeping the law is tantamount to them being circumcised because ultimately circumcision is not outward but inward. And then the key statement here you might not catch right off whose praise is not from men but from God the word Jew is from the word which means praise. The word Jew is from the word for praise. And so what it's a it's a play on words. Whose praise is not from men but from God. Who is the one who receives the praise of God? The one who is the true circumcised of the heart, not of the flesh. And that had to be something that hit pretty hard uh, against the Jewish people. Now, one thing I guess I want to ask here, though, is Paul saying here that now there is no such thing as a Jew. We've lost that distinction. Now we have no Jew or Gentile. We only have neutral people. Actually, he wrote it earlier in Galatians chapter 3 and 48. Well, see, and that's. Well, what do you mean by spiritually? Uh, because is there physically? Well, physically and ethnically, of course, there's a difference between Jews and Gentiles. But isn't the real issue here? Doesn't it come down to the question of what do you think of Christ? Salvation yeah. issue. And I, well, isn't what he's saying now that there really is only one way to eternal life? Was there ever but one way anyway? Exactly. So what about in the Old Testament when you had when you had Jews who were obedient in faith uh, and they were still Jews and they obeyed the law but they were also obedient in faith. It was inward and outward. Remember I talked about before sacrifices were desired outwardly? God instituted them. He wanted the sacrifices but he didn't want them without a clean heart. Circumcision. Did God command the circumcision? Yes, he wants a circumcision. What if a Jew said, hey, I'm a Jew of the heart. So you got this Jew before the time of Christ. He says, you know, I'm just a Jew of the heart. He's, he's a new, you know, he's, a, he's up and coming, new generation kind of guy. I, I want to do it differently. I, I just love God in my heart. Forget about circumcision. Would that have been acceptable to God? No, it would have been disobedience. You could claim to be a Jew inwardly, but if you didn't have that circumcision outwardly, you were not genuinely a Jew inwardly. Why? You're in disobedience. So see, we, we must be careful in this argument we don't lose something. Because when we get to chapter 3, Paul puts it all back together another way. So it's sort of like a, a, you know, a ball. You ever seen these kind of balls? You don't know, like these uh, bungee kind of... Ooh, you go down and you come up. You know, you can move to different extremes. Bring you back, you know, moving back in. People move too far one way or the other. See, Paul is using contrast here for emphasis. But if you take him too far, you miss his balance. See, he's going to get, he's going to take with one hand and give with the other. If you as a Jew said, I'm just a good Jew inside, I love God with all my heart, who cares about externals? God. Because <laughs> he instituted them. It's the thing with sacrifice. It's just getting the cart and the horse in the right order. Could, could you compare it to, say, baptism today? Oh, yeah. Baptism saves no one, but baptism is not optional for a believer. It's not optional at all. Matter of fact, I am convinced that baptism in the early church occurred in the midst of confession. See, the way it's so often done in evangelical churches in America today, um, we have, based on Charles Finney's aberrant theology, you know, we have the idea of either the anxious seat or even the idea of anyone who, who believes they want to give their life to God, you feel the tugging of God, raise your hand. Or come forward to the front and shake my hand and let's talk. 
All those activities are really merely substitutions for what the New Testament did in baptism. I would say, if you believe in Jesus, come to be baptized. Don't come shake my hand. Don't raise your hand. Just come and be baptized. Because it's in baptism where confession occurred in the early church. We separated them. You can have a person who says they come to Christ and ten years later be baptized. Or even not ten years, but maybe a week or two months or whatever. Next time we get around to it. Next time we can afford to fill the baptistry. Or whatever it may be. In other words, we have substituted something other than the truth of the scriptures in this area. But it's the same problem. The outward statement is not the reality. But you really don't separate it from the reality. To say I'm a Jew inwardly without being a Jew outwardly was denial. Whether it be obedience to the law or circumcision. It's not an either or, it's a both and. And you'll see that here as you work through Paul. Paul did say, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female. We're all one in Christ. We'll see, but Paul's not saying there are no women. I think Paul believed that there were both males and female persons. He also believed there were slaves and free pe people. He also believed there were Jews and Greeks because he was a Jew and he knew it. It's a contrast question, see. In reference to participation in Christ's covenant, these are irrelevant distinctions. But in another context, they're important distinctions. You have to say, what are you talking about? In reference to participation with Christ? No, I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or Greek. They both have faith and are required to have faith in Christ to be saved. Both. There's no distinction regarding them in reference to Abraham's covenant. Uh, there, it doesn't matter whether you're a slave or free in reference to participation in the, in the covenant with Abraham. See, these are irrelevant in reference to that question. It's not irrelevant in reference to every question. No, so I'm coming down to a question for you. Yes, sir. You talked about the circumcision, but does that mean then that once Christ paid the price for the Jew and the Gentile sins, that the Jew still needed to perform sacrifices? Well, <clears throat> did they need to perform sacrifices? Well, let me just say this. There's pretty good evidence that the early church until the destruction of... And by the way, the early church in Israel was all Jewish. <laughs> Everybody was a Jew. Pretty good evidence the disciples still went down and participated in the temple sacrifices, sure. But the difference is, is how you viewed the, the purpose. Were the sacrifices ever to forgive sins? Did any sacrifice forgive a single sin? No. The writer of Hebrews says, the blood of bulls and goats, are, it's impossible. Matter of fact, he uses impossible, I think, three times in that book. And one of the impossibles is this. Why, well, it's impossible God for lie. It's impossible for God to lie. It's another thing, it's impossible to renew again into repentance those that have crucified and so forth, Christ in Hebrews 6. And the other, it's impossible, not hard, but it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to forgive sins. That's true from the beginning till the, till the present time. And, and it was a misunderstanding on the part of some who thought they did. Sacrifices never had that function. Sacrifices merely look forward to the cross of Christ. That's all they did. So that means once the cross of Christ came and then passed. I could consider, the reason why I make this point, because we do find sacrifices reinstituted in Ezekiel. As Ezekiel talks about the, the coming temple, the temple of the millennial period. He speaks of temple and sacrifices. And people say that can't be sacrifices. I said, yes, it can't be. Because sacrifices in the Old Testament didn't forgive sins. Sacrifices in Ezekiel's temple wouldn't forgive sins either. It could easily be just a memorial. 
But then I think this question goes the second step. Would a Jew who today did not practice sacrifice be called disobedient? No, because you can't have sacrifice without the temple. Would a Jew who did not practice circumcision be called disobedient? Yeah. What's the difference? Because circumcision identifies them by by flesh with Abraham. I think you missed the part of the temple. Because I never caught that when you said that to me earlier this week. But the, the place where the sacrifice was was at the temple, and the temple was here today. Yeah, you cannot have sacrifices without the temple. That's why in Ezekiel's temple you reinstitute the sacrifices. But I don't think there's sacrifices to forgive sins. People look at that and say, that's got to be spiritual. I like the way Rodmacher, Dr. Earl Rodmacher says, when you spiritualize scripture, you tell spiritual lies. Spiritualiz spiritualizing is telling spiritual lies. And I I'm not into that either. When I look at that, see, I have no problem with that being a true physical reality. Because I don't think they ever were forgiving sins. Some people say, well, they couldn't have that because Jesus already died and he forgives sins. Yeah, that's true. But it was always true that way. <laughs> God always looked to the cross. He never looked to the sacrifices. Right, so if they looked to the cross, and the sacrifices looked to the blood of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. what is why was it necessary to sacrifice after Christ the cross? It all depends upon the reason why you do it. If you take the position I do of interpreting the scripture in a normal, literal sense, rather than telling spiritual lies, then there is a future millennial kingdom in which history has not ended. Uh, those people who do not hold to a millennial view believe that history has, soon comes to an end. When Christ comes, history ends. And I would argue history doesn't end. History continues. It continues in a different way. Is, is, is it different? But is, is, did history occur differently before the flood than after the flood? You bet. Catastrophic event occurred that changed the way things happened. But history continued. Well, you're saying two things. One, you're saying that history continued. The other saying that history changed. No, no, I'm not. The events changed, but the history still continued. Nothing changed. Well, but I, I can say both and both be accurate. I don't like to do that. Because history as a reality continues, but it continues in a different way. And that's why I mean history changes also. I didn't say history ends. I said history continues, but it changes. It still stays history, but it changes. Like what you see within it. It doesn't end. So that when Christ comes, history doesn't end. You still got people, time and space and matter. <laughs> and so right after Christ comes, you'll still have people obeying the law of God by necessity. Things continue. Different relationships and different events occur. So I have no problem with the idea of sacrifice in a kingdom because I, I can easily conceive sacrifices serve a different function. There's another temple, but now when they sacrifice in the temple, it will not be a sacrifice looking to the cross. It will be a sacrifice looking back at the cross. So you say that's strictly though within the millennial kingdom? During the millennial kingdom only. Because there's a temple again for a while. Isn't there also a temple before um, or somewhere near the whole uh, tribulation period? Yeah, there is, but that's the temple I'm talking about initially. But that's not Ezekiel's temple, though. Yes, reinstituted. The only difference there is that the Jews at the time who will start sacrificing during the tribulation period will think in a wrong-headed way about the function and purpose of sacrifice. They'll still be looking for the Messiah. But once finally they recognize, according to Ezekiel, uh, excuse me, according to Zechariah chapter 10, when, when Christ comes, they'll look upon him whom they have pierced, and all of a sudden things look different to them. There will be a massive conversion of the Jewish people, which Paul talks about in Romans chapter 11. But we'll get to that eventually, I think. 
So the important thing is, oh, yeah, oh, we always have time for okay. questions. I actually have a couple of them. One is, I'm trying to think of the audiences in this passage we just went through to get a better picture of They're them. Jews. Okay, but they're also Gentiles, right? Who are listening from the sidelines, so to speak. Okay, because I'm, I'm wondering if the Gentiles are tempted to or perhaps have entered into a practice of circumcision that he's addressing here. I don't think so. I mean, I don't know. I mean, possibly, yeah. but I don't think so. Okay. I don't see any evidence of it. Okay. And then, <coughs> too, about I think what Paul's doing is telling these Jews that they can't look down on Gentiles who are uncircumcised. Yeah. I think that's the point. He's leveling the ground. He's leveling the ground. He's, again, he's balancing issues here. Mm -hmm. He's going to hit real hard against the Jews, sort of putting them in their place, getting their head screwed on straight, and then he's got to turn back and, and take away the gloating of the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Because this is, see, you've got, you got two audiences here. <clears throat> I mean, you've got one audience, but you've got two emphases. So he's knocking the Jews, and the Gentiles are sitting over there and saying, yep, yep, that's what I've been saying too, you know, that's what I've been saying. And they're gloating, and then he's, he's pretty well knocked down these Jews, so now he's going to have to turn right back around and build them up again and put the Gentiles in their place. He's, he's working these two angles here all the way through the book. Do you think that the, the populace, the, the Romans in the church, what socioeconomic class were they? Probably mostly poor. There were probably some wealthy people, but yeah. But, but you still have instances of people who are well off. But mostly, mostly slaves are poorer classes. I just wonder if there was, if, 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 I mean, they looked at Jews with a heritage and, and all this kind of stuff. And, <clears throat> and your Jews would not have been slaves. Right. Yeah. They're free men. I guess I also kind of wonder these two things because I see something else going on today. If there's this kind of envy of of Jews. I, I see a lot of non-Jewish people going around with robes and Karens and carrying big scrolls and speaking Hebrew horribly or really trying to read it. I don't know if you know Who are these people? <laughs> a lot they, they're hangers on to a messianic movement. They're trying to become act like Jews? Exactly. Yeah. Now we're, we're not to become Jews but we're to respect Jews for what they are. I have no problem if, if a Jewish person wants me to participate in a Passover Seder for the purpose of, of sharing and, 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 and appreciating the culture. But the Passover is not mine. When I come there, I merely come as a guest. For a Jew, it's their history. We, we got three minutes to break up. I'm breaking up right now? Yeah, you did sound good, so okay. Okay, I don't know. It's starting to break up again. Can, can you hear me okay? I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just not talking up right. No, they're static. They're, they're static? Yeah. I'm going to take off my jacket. I'm trying to stay dressed. Okay. Okay. Am I there now? Yeah. Okay. Again, if this becomes a big issue, just simply tie, put the thing up. I'll stick. I'll, I'll tie down. We have another... Okay. Okay. Uh, so to answer the thing, I think there is this this problem in the church back and forth between the Jew and the Gentile, and he's trying to lift one up, put the other down, put the other down, uh, put the one up, lift the after he's putting him down, put him up. He's trying to maintain a balance here. There are pros and cons. But see, this you knew, you knew the Jew really hit for he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is of the heart. Now what I want to know though, is Paul saying that a Gentile becomes a Jew if he is then circumcised in the heart? Is that what he's arguing here? He like a Jew. I, think he, I think he's like a Jew, but he's not a Jew. And you have to be careful because you'll have people say, see Paul believes that the church became Israel. And Paul believes that Gentiles are Jews. And they say, that's wrong. You're missing his point. He doesn't deny that there's still the Jew and the, and the Gentile. He never, he, Paul never calls a Gentile a Jew. He says, but they become like a Jew. In other words, it's, it's putting a Jew to the test. Be a, if you're a Jew, not only be a Jew outwardly, be inwardly a Jew. For someone who is uncircumcised becomes as if he were. Not that he is. But if he were circumcised, if he believes, see, they receive the praise of God like a Jew.
So we're going to start then with chapter 3 now. But does this also mean Hold on. that uh, you have to keep the law to be like a Jew? In other words, that's the no. fact that you're a Christian. No. He's going on and on about the law here. No, I don't think he says that. We're going to let it break.